Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and others. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and joining me this week is a treat of a guest, Jen Rafferty, and I cannot wait for you all to listen to this episode. Let me tell you a little bit about Jen. Educator, author, and founder of Empowered Educator, Jen Rafferty started as a middle school music teacher for 15 years in central New York. She is known for bringing her energy, her humor, her expertise, and presentations while inspiring educators to stay connected to their why. Jen is a certified emotional intelligence practitioner and is currently a PhD candidate in educational psychology. Since its inception, the Empowered Educator has reached teachers and school leaders all over the world. Jen has been featured in Authority Magazine, Medium, Thrive Global, Wellness Voice, Best Holistic Life, and was on the TEDx stage with her talk, Generational Change Begins with Empowered Teachers. She is also the host of a podcast, Take Notes with Jen Rafferty, which is rated in the top 3% of podcasts globally. And yours truly, along with our colleague, Dr. Teresa Peterson, have both been guests. So we'll be sure to link to those episodes in the show notes. Jen's insatiable curiosity continues to make the Empowered Educator programs relevant and reflective of the most up-to-date research in mindset, leadership, and cognitive neuroscience. She is committed to inspiring teachers and school leaders to discover their voice and maintain a healthy longevity throughout their careers. Welcome to the show, Jen Rafferty. What else do you, you want folks to know about you? Hi. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's so great to talk with you again. And, you know, something else maybe people might want to know about me is right now, I'm loving the new Beyonce album. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I feel like I'm an old person in the sense of I just haven't, I've heard some of the songs, but I haven't listened to it. No, you need to listen to the whole thing start to finish. It is an experience. It is brilliant. (laughs) And it is giving me life right now. (laughs) I love that. I love that so much. That's why I love asking this question, because you never know what people will answer with. (laughs) And that, my friends, is part of what you can expect in this conversation with Jen is unexpected moments of just absolute joy and (laughs) humanity. Yes. So what uh what's your favorite song? Oh my gosh. Two most songs. Two most wanted is I think my favorite. I can't listen to it without crying. <laughs> and I've listened to it several <laughs> times at this point. There's something about it's it's a Miley Cyrus Beyonce duo and it oh, just does something to me. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That I feel like needs to be the assignment post podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is, well, I'm definitely going to listen to it post podcast, and we encourage those who haven't, right? Yes, and, you know, see what reaction comes up for you. Um, <laughs> I love it. Okay, so Jen, talk to I, w- I want you to take us on a journey because this is the first time our audience is getting introduced to you, and even though they heard, you know, the the formal bio, talk to us a little bit about what's the work you're most passionate about. And then take us back to what was your journey to this work, right? So it's a two-parter. Mm. And, but let's start with where you are and what led you to where you are. I love this question. You know, the thing that gets me up in the morning and gets the, you know, the fire under my butt is this idea that there is more in this life than mm. we have come to accept. This Mm. status quo that we feel is, you know, it is what it is, and this is just how I am, isn't acceptable to me anymore. And Mm. my role in this world, and I think the context to which I'm coming into this conversation right now is through my work with Empowered Educator and teaching educators specifically about this shift in mindset to open the doors to what's possible for them through concepts of not just mindset, but emotional intelligence rooted in cognitive neuroscience. So they continue to have this sense of agency in their own life and Mm. move from this passenger side of, of things where they're passively engaging in their life to really taking an active role in that driver's seat. And my feeling about working with educators is that everybody has to go to school. So if children are walking into classrooms with teachers, principals, bus drivers, school nurses, who 
know their self-worth, who have a toolkit of strategies for self-regulation to navigate the stressors that happen in their life, to have techniques to manage their emotions in ways that are healthy and safe and productive, they are learning then how to become these adults who also know these things. And it's not enough for just the adults to tell them what to do. They have to model it themselves. So the work that I do gets to kind of allow people an opportunity to wake up and I hand them kind of a flashlight and a map. (laughs) And it's, you know, this is your own journey. And here are the tools that can help you get to point A to point B. So that's, that's kind of where I am right now. Can I, can I pause on that for a second? And then I do want to honor your background so we can hear about what has shaped that. There was two things that were coming up for me. One, just this morning, as I was flipping through Instagram, the, (laughs) as we do, uh, as we do, um, and I, and I didn't I didn't catch the name, but it was a, a a child psychologist who does a lot of work on right how parents show up. And one of the points he was making is that you know kids learn from their environment; they learn from the people that are you know raising them, influencing them. And and the point he made was you know the the top child psychologists don't work on fixing the kids they work on improving the parents and there's something about that that was connecting for me as you were talking about the impact that teachers can make is it can can be even more significant um based off of how they're showing up how they're role modeling what they're uh demonstrating for the kids Um, So that was one thought. But the second thought that I was curious about is hearing the language you were using about um, passive acceptance. Obviously, we see this a lot in just everyone, myself included, right? There's rules, there's social constructs. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on education in America is so um, prescribed right? There's so, there's so much autonomy that has been taken away from teachers and how they show up and how they think about the learning. And, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on what's your sense on the role that that contributes to perhaps even more of a sense of being a passive participant? And, and you know, so for folks who maybe don't have children or aren't connected to it, right? There's regulations, there's curriculum, there's in, especially in public schools anyway, uh, that are expected, there's standards, there's, it's very prescribed in a lot of cases uh, where the teacher doesn't have the creative freedom and the autonomy. And I'm curious how that, that being their reality then contributes to feeling passive about their identity. Oh, it's all connected. It's a big question. It's, it is yeah. very, very connected. And it, it leads to kind of the place that I am right now. But I'll start at, back at the beginning. You know, you look at the evolution of the telephone, what the telephone looked like when it was first invented to what it looks like now. You look at like you look at the evolution of the model of a car and how we used to. I just actually today read, I think this week in the 1800s was when the Pony Express first came to be, which blew my mind. And now we look at how we communicate with the click of a button, you know, Mm -hmm. just like that. You think about how a car has has progressed. And you take a look at schools 100 or so years ago Mm -hmm. and schools Mm -hmm. today, and not much Mm -hmm. has changed. And (laughs) sorry, like (laughs) that's a I don't know that I've ever seen it presented like that. And it's causing me some pain. Yeah, it's so visceral. please continue on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is visceral, right? And you have this moment like, oh, right? And, you know, this is a little bit by default, but it's also by design for a lot of reasons. I don't know that we'll um, have time for in the context of this particular conversation. But I, I do think it's important to recognize that schools are steeped in tradition mm. and Tradition unchecked is is what is what's causing this perpetual space of being passive because this, this if this is just the way it's always been done then we don't really have to think about it and even the things that we consider forward motion are still steeped within this system that is based in this tradition and in my world 
tradition is just peer pressure from dead people. Like, that's <laughs> that's how we kind of define tradition around here. <laughs> Holy shit, Jen. Yeah. Tradition is peer pressure by dead people. Yes. Nick, that's the clip right there, too. <laughs> It, Christ. Right. I mean, like, let's be honest about this. And, I, and I'm, I want to be real here, too. I'm not knocking tradition, but again, tradition without some sort of reflection or or a check in of like, is this actually serving us? Is this actually something we yeah. want to be doing? Is this actually aligned with who I am and who I want to be and who we are as an organization and where we want to go? And then to have the self-worth, the sense of self-worth enough to know that you can be an agent of change. I mean, that's how mm. things start to move, but we've been missing these pieces because of this idea of tradition and passively moving along that I think it's bred a, a lot of sense of helplessness that mm -hmm. we, it, it doesn't matter what we say because Moving mountains in education, particularly riding around policy, that's a bear. But yeah. at the end of the day, organizations don't change until people change. And so yeah. if we're getting to the grassroots of what we're doing here, one person at a time, one educator at a time, that's when the values are going to start to shift. And that's when we're going to start gaining some momentum in this new trajectory. You're... I you're the way you describe things and articulate it is I'm, I'm very much enjoying the, the simplicity of the language you use to describe things that can be sometimes discussed in a way that's very overcomplicated and serious. And it's not <laughs> and serious. <laughs> but, I mean, just the, even just the simple thing of organizations don't change till people change. I'm like, Damn, that's got to go on a quote board. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quoting Jen now yes. in all of my conversations. So <laughs> thank you for that gift. You're so welcome. Um, <laughs> We're just getting um, started. Yeah, I know. Uh, I love it. Just send me your invoice for all the <laughs> insights and wisdom that I'm gaining from this conversation. Um, so what led you to this work? I always think it's interesting to hear a little bit of what you know. Yeah, just what led you to this work? Yeah, the origin story, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I was a music teacher in central New York. I loved it. I was in the classroom for 15 years, and I really thought that was going to be my job forever. It was like mm -hmm. a calling for me. When I was 12 years old, being in my seventh grade choir, I saved the little dittos and the worksheets because I thought future Jen might need them one day for her <laughs> classroom. <laughs> it. That's, that's just what it was. And so I did, I went, I went to Ithaca college and I had my music education degree and I also majored in vocal performance and um, I, I loved every bit of it. And I became really interested in brain development because I was teaching middle school and, mm -hmm. you know, when people hear that, you know, anyone teaches middle school, they're either like, oh, bless your heart or like, you're crazy. Um, it's yeah. definitely a little <laughs> bit of both. <laughs> um, but that particular age was so fascinating to me because adolescents go through just incredible changes, you know, in their mind and in their bodies and in their emotional development. That it's not visible like it is when you see babies mm -hmm. grow from zero to two. Mm -hmm. And I thought that if I understood them a little bit more developmentally, I could be a better teacher because I'd be more responsive. So I started mm -hmm. my journey into cognitive neuroscience right at the beginning of my career. And I built so many cool programs for them. You know, we had a whole guitar program and it started into then this modern band program where kids were really bringing back garage band culture in yeah. our community and still are now they're writing and producing and performing their own stuff. And, um, I got to a point where I was conducting honors choirs throughout New York State. I was presenting conferences about adolescent development and music education nationally, wrote a book in December of 2019. And then COVID happened. Mm. <laughs> and then I, I feel like so many people's origin story is and then March 2020 right. happened. <laughs> That's how it and goes. And it all changed. And it yeah. all changed, you know, and I <laughs> but I think there's there's 
there's going to be so much research about that, you know, coming, I mean, how, how people pivoted and, but that's another conversation too. But, you know, with that, in addition to this like professional identity crisis I had to go through because teaching online was a whole new thing. Singing itself mm-hmm. was really very dangerous at the time. If you remember, you know, it was yeah, killing right. people. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, you know, in and, and that same time, I was also going through a divorce with my husband and I had moved out of my house that same weekend. The world shut down and my kids were five wow. and seven. So it was this, you know, personal, professional shift that needed to happen. Um, so I took off what I thought would just be a semester to homeschool my kids, started my PhD in educational psychology, started my own healing journey where I, I mm. really started to implement the practices of mindset and emotional intelligence. And then coupled that with what I knew in my research now with cognitive neuroscience, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is the missing piece. If, mm-hmm. if educators knew this, then it would lead to so much better outcomes for them and for their Mm -hmm. students, because we couldn't ignore the fact that teachers were stressed anymore during COVID. Like Mm -hmm. this was a problem Mm -hmm. we couldn't ignore. And then Mm -hmm. Empowered Educator was born in the spring of 2021. And we've been kind of on this fast track of growth and expansion ever since. It's amazing. It's amazing. And well, and I'm, and I'm, I'm also thinking about the reality during that time for educators not only were they experiencing what many people were experiencing and figuring out how to pivot, but then depending on where you lived, there is a lot of vitriol around how you were approaching it, whether you should stay at home. You know, that was, we, we did a lot of work with education systems of how do we navigate these incredibly emotionally charged conversations. And And we saw firsthand how demoralizing it was for so many educators. And you're, you know, and so, so as we lean into part of what we wanted to make sure we gave space to today, you, the language you're using is right. How to, um, how to increase your your awareness, that emotional intelligence, understanding the brain, understanding what does that mean for you and how you show up. And, and how to be intentional about that in your own healing. I would argue that I think everyone needs to understand their brain so much more than they do. Why, why isn't there just basic psychology classes for like, you know, I mean, there are, we right? to emotion, social intelligence programs, but uh, it's, there's so much, I feel there's a lot of unnecessary suffering when you don't understand your body, you don't understand your mind, you don't understand what you actually do have control over, or at least what are options to be able to navigate it differently. And uh, which brings us to this idea of, uh, well, you just, you know, if you want to get better and feel better, you just need to think better. You just need to be positive about stuff. And and I love that you pitched this or offered it as a topic, which is to explore that idea of positive psychology versus toxic positive psychology. Because there there's so much, I'm just going to be honest, there's so much bullshit out there and there's so much harmful messaging that all you need to do in order to heal is just think happy thoughts. And it's so devastatingly harmful. So with that, my friend, where do you want to go? Yeah, well, you're <laughs> where do right. Where you want to go from there? It is harmful. And toxic positivity is is something that I came to realize was um, <laughs> an interesting like industry term, if you will, in, in this educational space and, and perhaps in the corporate space too. But in, in some other industries with people who are also kind of doing this work, they were like, what do you mean? toxic. How could, how could positivity be toxic? How could it possibly be toxic? And you know, what happens is we're kind of gaslit into believing that it, like you said, if we simply just think happy thoughts, then everything's fine. And there must be something wrong with me or I'm broken mm-hmm. in some way because mm-hmm. that's not working. And mm-hmm. the truth is you're not broken. You're perfectly whole. You don't need to be fixed. And it's not, that simple. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is an over 
it is an oversimplification of some very real concepts. And positive psychology is great, but it, it becomes toxic when the messaging gets bastardized in that way. Mm. And it's like mm-hmm. things come out, not just think happy thoughts, but also this idea of, well, if we just remember our why, then it'll be mm. okay. Mm. Mm. And the thing is, and mm. I know you and I have had this conversation. Mm-hmm. Yes, remembering your why is really important. And it is essential in making aligned decisions. But just saying, remember your why as um, the antidote for feeling like shit (laughs) is Mm -hmm. not actually going to do it. And you're actually going to continue to feel more resentful and frustrated and angry. It's going to make it worse. So what do we do? Well, I don't often use the word positive in my work ever. I like to use the word alignment Because Mm. alignment for me, even saying that word alignment does something to my body, there is this inner connection that I have with then a decision that I'm making, with something that I'm saying, with a thought that I choose to attach to. It doesn't always have to be positive, but my intention is that it always feels aligned. And that shift can be really powerful in reminding people of their agency. And again, there's nothing wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Your job is to to learn more about you to feel what feels aligned and what feel what doesn't feel aligned. Mm. Mm. What what type of you know what type of pushback have you or resistance or yeah, but Jen, what about in these situations? What what does that look like in in your world in your work? I always love the yeah, but moments because it's, I feel like that's where the juice is. (laughs) Yeah. So what's interesting is I think I used to get a lot of yeah, buts at the beginning because some people, so first of all, resistance is natural. The yeah, buts Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are a part of the process. If Mm. you're listening to something new, like, hey, (laughs) you don't actually have to think positive anymore. Just think aligned. Your brain's going to be like, oh, hell no. We've been thinking like this for so long. It's worked for us. And now you're, you know, this crazy lady on this podcast is telling me to think differently. This is not going to happen. And the first line of defense for that is resistance. Like, yeah, but. Mm. And so that's like, first of all, recognizing it for what it is that this resistance is part of your brain's job to keep you alive because it's keeping you safe and keeping you the same. And we can talk about that in a little bit if you'd like, but Mm -hmm. I know you do that in your work. So hopefully your listeners are familiar at least with that. And, you know, the yeah, buts kind of teeter off for me when we continue to bring it back to your biology. This is Mm -hmm. your, this is your biology. This isn't um, about the circumstance. Your sense of alignment comes from you knowing yourself. And if you know yourself more, if you know your programming, if you know how your brain is wired for different situations, if you know that you have adapted to respond in a conflict situation with hostility, because that's what you learned was safe growing up, you needed to have that when you were younger, um, then you have that, again, flexibility to choose and make a new aligned decision that now serves you. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen to make that safe and to make that sustainable. But those are the kinds of things that we continue to go back to. It's like, this isn't your fault. This isn't um, something that you could have controlled. But now that you're an adult and you're no longer in that same environment in which you had to adapt to, you're in a different environment. Mm-hmm. How do you want to show up in this space? And that's usually when people come around to like, oh, okay. And we talk mm-hmm. about having that radical personal responsibility that you are responsible for how you show up in a space. So, so the ball's in your court. The ball's always in your court. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's that uh, uh, my my good friend and colleague who we've had on the show a few times, Farah Harris, she talks a lot about the importance of essentially the family origin of your emotions of, you know, we've adapted that to what are what did you learn about how to show up with conflict? What did you learn about how to show up with conversation? And one of the things, even in hearing your your language, which I appreciate, I can still see folks sometimes maybe going um, or not realizing that 
choosing to show up differently from how you've shown up for 40 years, for 30 years, right? Doesn't change in a single moment. It's in, 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 and, uh, knowing that you love neuroscience, like I do, I wonder if you can talk about what does that effort really look like? Because sometimes what we see is people might get frustrated with themselves. And to be clear, folks, this was me a lot of times until I understood that <laughs> it's repetition over and over and over. Um, and they can become frustrated or impatient with other people, right? So my world is largely corporate America. And, you know, I gave them feedback and they did it for a week and then they went right back to their old self. And I was like, yeah, of course they did. <laughs> the, the, the choice to, to show up differently doesn't automatically change the autopilot uh, behavior. So I'm curious if you can dive into that a little bit. Like, let, let's nerd out a little bit yes. around what does that actually, what does it take when you're clear about it to make those sustained changes so that eventually they can become easier? Yes. I'm so glad you asked this question. So the first thing, and I hope people are listening, please write this down. <laughs> Change happens at the speed of safety. <gasps> Oh, is that yours? It is. It is not mine. It is a conglomerate. I mean, like a conglomerate not everything. Of everything it. is. Yeah, everything is pulled from everything. Change happens I at don't... the speed of safety. Um, mm. the the person that comes to mind who says this, I know the most, who's always in my ear, is a woman named Tracy Litt. Um, she okay. she talks a lot about this too. You know, change happens at the speed of safety, and this, of course, is in all of the literature about about the longevity of change, yeah. you know? And so one of the um, examples actually Tracy uses, and I'll, I'll share this here, is that, you know, imagine you're going skiing and you're up on the top of the mountain and you've always gone to the right. Now, I know this is not actually how skiing works, but just bear with me. <laughs> so you're going <laughs> to the top of the mountain and you're always going to the right. So if you've always gone to the right. There are, you know, groove marks in the snow ready to go for you. So you get to the top, you don't have to think about it. You're just going to the right. Well, what if one day you get to the top and you're like, actually, wait a second. I think I want to go left. Well, it takes it's a certain amount of intention and effort on your part, your mind, body, your nervous system to make that new decision. And there are no groove marks there. It is fresh snow. So you go down there and you get back up to the top and you're just about to go right again. You're like, Ooh, I really do want to go left. And then eventually you keep going left. You keep going left with intention and the right side of the mountain is going to feel covered with snow. And then the left side is going to have the groove marks in it. And that's essentially a really simplified version of how neuroplasticity mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. But your question about like, well, what happens at the top of that mountain for you to consistently make that decision is nervous system regulation and creating safety for yourself. Because mm. your brain, and I alluded to this before, isn't going, you know, your brain's main function is to keep you alive. So if you exactly. are, yeah, if you're listening to this podcast, like you're, you're winning today. You, yeah. you got it. <laughs> <laughs> your brain's like, we're good. We're done. Um, but it's always looking for threats and not just threats like, you know, bears chasing us. Threats like we were talking about on my podcast too, you know, mm -hmm. emails, right? Mm -hmm. Um Threats like making a new choice when you're interacting with somebody. Yeah. Threats like how am I going to um, sit in this traffic right now? <laughs> you know, these are, these are if you're constantly stressed about sitting in the traffic and one day you're like, you know, it'd be really nice to just not feel this way. Your brain is not <laughs> going to let you do that because it has no evidence of you doing that and surviving to tell the tale. So we need to stop waiting for external circumstances to allow us to feel safe. This mm. is our agents. This is everything. This is our strength. This is our power. This is what it means to feel empowered. You have choices in every moment and creating safety for yourself is one of the mm. most powerful things that you can do. So what does this look like? One of the things for nervous, nervous system regulation that you can do, it's super easy, is breathing. And I know breathing gets a bad rap because mm -hmm. you're like, Jen, mm -hmm. you're not going to change the world by deep breathing. And you're right. That's ridiculous. But what you are going to do is create a, a place for your nervous system to feel safe so that then you can do 
the next thing. Become who you want to be. Say what you actually want to say. Um, you know, nervous system regulation involves not only moving from this survival state to a state of safety or protection into performance, but as you know, you're also gaining access to your prefrontal cortex, literally yeah. the part of your brain that you need to make the new decision, to continue to do that. And so that's, this is the kind of the skinny of it. The first thing is the self-regulation, but the second piece is also the celebration. And I think that we forget mm. about that part too, mm. because mm. we make the new choice and we're like, okay, I did it. And then we expect it to just happen again. Well, no, we need yeah. to continue to create that nervous system regulation and create that safety before, during, after, and then mm. celebrate because all of that rush of, of dopamine and serotonin that you're gonna get, or even oxytocin, if you're calling a friend and be like, hey, I used my voice in this meeting today, or like, hey, I was sitting in traffic and I didn't, you know, I didn't scream out my window today. Yeah. You know, like whatever it is, that celebration is going to allow for more of those beautiful neurotransmitters to solidify the new ways of thinking. And then eventually that is going to start to become your new autopilot. So um, patience and grace is the name of the game in all of this. Yeah. Yeah. We, there's, uh, I don't remember where, what inspired this, but there was a phrase I started using years and years ago, which is celebrate the catch. Mm -hmm. The moment, the moment, because when people start to, when you start to work on wanting to be more intentional, when you start to work on uh, increasing your awareness, increasing your regulation, increasing being intentional, you just will start noticing more all the times when you're not. And, and it can be so easy to fall into shaming yourself, blaming yourself. And then I think you'll appreciate this. I don't think actually I've talked about this on the show, but I call it the shame, shame boomerang. So <laughs> meaning you're going to shame yourself. I'm now telling you you're going to shame yourself. And then you're going to get caught between this like, oh, shoot, I did it again. Damn it. Sarah told me I would do this. Boom, 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 boom. And then it just becomes this like boomerang. But that idea of celebrating and I, I is really important because that's a moment of awareness and it's a moment of choice. And I appreciate you expanding on that idea from the standpoint of and what is happening neurologically is you're getting all these chemicals that are reinforcing that new behavior. I, <laughs> I, I. <laughs> I w I'm thinking about my friend sent me a, a meme or a, I don't know, some post last night that was like, stop telling me to push outside my comfort zone. What if I want to go into an even comfier zone and just like sleep on a hot bread roll or <laughs> I forget what it was. But, it, but so anyway, I was thinking about that as you were talking. The other thing that I, here's what I'm curious about, you know, this idea of how do you create safety for yourself? Again, just another another gift for of language and perspective and ways we can think about the conversations we have with ourselves and others. One of the things I've learned through my own therapy is one of the ways I can regulate is inside out, right? How how I'm thinking about things, how I'm um, perspectives I'm taking, and sometimes I can't do it inside out. I have to do it outside in which is a little bit what's getting to the breathing. And so I'm curious to hear other strategies from you. Like what are some of those other strategies of that kind of cognitive inside out to help us create safety for ourselves? And what are some additional strategies to create safety for ourselves? That's more like outside in. And I'll just like share a couple of examples for the audience. Uh, if I'm under a lot of stress, taking a really warm shower helps, right? Um, can, can, does a whole lot of things to your body, um, to help calm that down. Touching, appropriate touching, right? For me, it's contact with Nick is really like, that's a, that's a deregulator, uh, and that helps increase safety. I would love to hear from you when you look at it through those buckets. What, what else have you found to be really effective for creating safety for yourself? Yeah. So I think the, for, for somebody who's kind of dabbling this, the inside out approach, I think can be a little bit slippery because yeah. your brain cannot be trusted. 
<laughs> your, your brain cannot be that needs to go on a t-shirt yeah <laughs> <laughs> or that's got to be a title of a book you're going to write yeah. or an article you're going to write right. your brain cannot be trusted it is not a place like hang out and be like okay got it you're telling me truths because it's not telling you yeah. truths right your your brain and actually i saw you know we're bringing up these memes but there's so many nerdy memes that you promised we, we could nerd out so here we go there was one yeah, yeah, yeah. That I saw that, like, it. it's so interesting that all of the research on brains has come from a brain <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's mad i know i know it keeps me up at night uh, but you know the truth is like your brain's job is to think thoughts just like your eyes blink and your heart beats and your lungs breathe we think mm. you know anywhere from 65,000 to 85,000 thoughts mm-hmm. every single day and most of them are either fear ego or past experiences so if mm. you're if you're going into this journey and you're like okay i'm going to sit and i'm going to like think about how i feel that probably wouldn't be my um my invitation to your first course of action. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. any way we can get it out and get it on paper. So even journaling, if you want to do an inside Mm. out thing and and journal, beautiful. Um, That could be a way. So I tend to go towards the outside in way first because we can't see our thoughts, but we can feel our feelings. And Mm. that is always the gateway to then what it is we're thinking. So if we start there, because you know, the truth is our bodies talk to us all the time. We're just terrible Mm. listeners. And so if we start to pay attention to, you know, I've had this headache for three weeks and I don't know why, you know, or my shoulders have been wanting to be earrings for the last three days, or, you know, I've had this skin rash that came out of nowhere and it's been three months and I don't know what's going on. This is your body's only language that it has to communicate with you. And so instead of doing nothing, which is usually what we do, and we just keep on going because we've got a job to do and we've got to pick up the kids from soccer and get to work on time. What if you stop for a second and asked yourself, what is this headache telling me? Mm. What is this stomach pain telling me? Mm. And really connect with what your body is asking from you. What do Mm. you need right now? So Asking the right questions is really important in this process. It's not like, why am I feeling this way? Because mm-hmm. that sometimes doesn't matter in the moment. It's it's what is this telling me and what do I need? And, mm. and then we can kind of go into, okay, well, then now what can I do? So rest, huge, right? I would love to be in a place, in a world in which people prioritize rest for themselves and rest of the people they love. Yeah, you know, my kids know, do not wake me. <laughs> if I am sleeping and it is Sunday and it is 930, go get yourself a bowl of cereal. It's you're fine. Um, and they know that my rest is valuable because in order for me to show up as the mom that I want to be and I know the mom that they want me to be, I, I need my sleep. Um, things we mentioned, like taking a hot shower, having physical touch, you know, there are so many ways we can approach this through, um, that sensory stimulation, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. smelling something nice, um, touching something, you know, interesting with texture. Um, we can go to that physical place of moving, taking a hot shower, connecting with nature, putting your feet in the grass, right? And the thing that I like to talk about, which I know we have this connection with, is the arts, is actively engaging in the arts where you can access that emotional part of you through whether it's listening to Beyonce or taking out your little jelly pens and doing a little doodle for yourself, you know, joining an improv class um, Mm -hmm. or singing in the shower, you know, whatever it is to, to, connect to that emotional part of you that desperately needs your attention gets to be your priority. (sighs) Jen. I I look forward to going back and listening to this conversation. There's so many, there's so many gifts in that and that just that, what is it telling me is just even that, what, what is it telling? What is, what is the the tension in my shoulder telling me? And I I you know just in the few conversations that that we've had together, I just, I know we share this value of rest, and that is something we as a company 
fight for. It's something that has been one of the things I've been, I'll I'll say it this way, untangling that relationship with hustle, that relationship with needing to feel like rest needs to be earned, needing to feel like rest is so that you can become more productive. And when rest is the one of the most important linchpins in our mental health. I know for me, if I if I don't get if I have two nights where I'm not sleeping well, I know my anxiety is going to increase. I know my intrusive thoughts for my OCD are going to become perhaps harder to let just fly through. I I know all of this. And that is something that uh, we it's it's so biological that our bodies crave it. And and I'm speaking from American culture because we know we have a global audience, but our American culture is chase hustle and let's bring it back around and chase happiness. And those can be incredibly, incredibly harmful. So I'm glad that you brought up that idea of of rest just for the sake of rest and to really prioritize that. And imagine what would be possible if we actually honored and prioritized rest. And and I just, I want to thank you too for that gift of, and wanting that for the people you love too. Yeah. And how do you contribute to that? And how do you make that easier? And how do you support that? Or whatever the case is. I, I feel very fortunate now. I am surrounded by people who are trying to do this for themselves, which makes it easier for me to do it for myself too. But right? that's the whole thing, right? Because that is that is exactly what we bring it back to the beginning, how organizations change. Because yeah. when you are doing it for you and you understand the value for you, then you are going to support the person next to you who is also doing it for themselves. And then together, th- this is how it changes. And so often we're like, think that it's more productive. But uh, but again, we're like going ba- based on this tradition, this tradition of hustle, this tradition of how we think we get things done and what it means to be productive. We're all just like screaming into the void and nobody's yeah. listening and we're getting really angry about it. Where if we just took a second and held up a mirror to ourselves, which I understand can be profoundly uncomfortable, yeah. that's actually how you are going to make the change that you so desperately want. Yeah. And then that's that's where the alignment comes in. 100%. Right? Who who do I want to be? How do I want to feel? How do I want to show up? What's the impact I want to make? And what do I need to do in order to make that? Not just the impact on others, but the impact on yourself, which can be really difficult for folks. <sighs> I, I feel like this is such a natural, beautiful place to wind down our conversation because I'm like, you've given us so much and I just want to keep talking to you. So we're just going to have to have you back on the show. Sounds great. Jen, I want to ask you the question that we ask all of our first time guests. And since you're our first time guest, I want to hear it from you. The the idea of the show is how do we change the conversations we have with ourselves and others? And you've given us a plethora of things we can think about uh, for ourselves and with others. And I'm curious for you personally, what was a conversation you had with yourself or someone else that was transformative for you? Wow. You know, I think for I'll, I'll say the conversation that I really had to have with myself and I had to call myself out on my own bullshit mm. and the the excuses that I would believe the, the lies that I would tell myself. I remember in therapy, we were talking once about lying to yourself. I was like, oh, no, no, that's not me. I don't I don't want myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked back at that moment like, oh my God, it's adorable. Uh, I'm sure your therapist was like, uh-huh. T- tell me more about that. So, yeah, That's cute. Right. Adorable. Um, but like I got to a point where I, I had to I, I had to decide, you know, who did I want to be? And it was during that that time of COVID where everything changed. I had no choice but to be reflective in that moment because everything I thought I was the day before, I wasn't mm. all of a sudden the next day. And mm. I can look back on that uh, as an opportunity for, for me to really sit with my feelings. You know, I, I couldn't escape. I, I didn't have, you know, any place we, we couldn't go anywhere. I, I was literally home with my feelings about everything. 
And I had this moment of reckoning of, you know, Jen, who do you want to be in this world? Mm-hmm. And, and how many excuses are you going to continue to, to buy so you're, you stay small and you mm-hmm. don't become the person that you know you can be? And it was a, a journey of growth and, and incredible discomfort similar to growing pains that we feel as kids, you know, it it was physical at times. Um, But I was not available to, you know, at the end of my life, (laughs) see what I could have become and then just didn't. And that's the thing that actually brings me to tears right now. You know, like Mm -hmm. I've I've done this exercise many times where, you know, you kind of visualize this future version of yourself, your 85 year old self. And that vision is so clear to me. And so for me being 40 year old Jen, I get to ask myself, you know, what would she do? I don't make my own decisions anymore. She does all the time Yeah. because when I'm stuck in that place of, Ooh, I don't know, or it feels scary or so uncomfortable. I regulate my nervous system and I'm like, "Ah, what does she do? And then I just do Mm -hmm. that. And that has been some of the most transformative conversations that I've been able to have with myself and, the work that I've done that has continued to lead me in that direction. Beautiful, beautiful. I love all of that. And what a, again, just another uh, powerful reflection uh, and a tool or an activity that, that we can do for ourselves. Jen, for people who are listening to this and feeling the same way I am, which is inspired and in love with you and curious about how they can work with you. we, and, and I guess we didn't, we weren't explicit about this at the top of the, the, the show, but what is the, like, who are your clients? Who, and, and how can they reach out to you? Yeah. So my clients are mostly educators. And what I mean by educators is anyone has any sort of relationship with kids. So we work with mm-hmm. teachers and administrators, paraprofessionals, office staff, and parents, because mm. when all of the adults in our kids' lives are experiencing their authenticity and walking the walk and knowing their self-worth, that's when our kids are able to do the same. So Mm. we don't yet work with kids. There's a K-12 curriculum coming up, but we work with the adults who are around kids right now. And so there's a lot of different ways to work with us. We offer lots of different courses online that you can take at a self-paced kind of way. But then there's also a really cool summer camp that we're offering right now, a virtual summer camp, which is Redesign Your Mind, which is quite literally taking you through some of the processes that I've kind of given you the high level explanation to of how do you make change? How do you make sustainable growth? How do you continue to show up in alignment for yourself? Because it isn't a one and done. It's not a quick fix. It's not an overnight Mm -hmm. thing. It's a process and it's a process with community. So this is a a 12 week program that we're taking people through starting June 3rd. And it's the work that I practice every, I practice everything I teach. So, you know, this is the stuff that got me from that day sobbing my eyes out on the couch in March of 2020 to being on the TEDx stage 18 months later and now running this incredible company where I get to teach people to do the same thing. So it's, awesome. it's powerful. Yeah. And what's the best way for people to connect with you then? Hello at empowerededucator.com is a great email and on Instagram, Jen Rafferty underscore. Awesome. And we'll post all of that in the show notes. What a gift. Ah, you're Thank a you gift. so much for being on the show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's always so fun to talk with you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to more. And the work that you're doing is so great. I'm so glad our paths crossed. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, my friend. Our guest this week has been Jen Rafferty. And boy, oh boy, she is such a quotable <laughs> thinker. Organizations don't change until people change. I still am giggling a little bit at this idea of traditions is just peer pressure by dead people and not to discredit tradition. There's an important part of tradition. I love a lot of traditions, but I also love that perspective that they don't always need to go unchecked. Uh, And the thing that I'm really, I'm really thinking about is what are all the ways I can continue to create safety for myself and help others do the same. 
So we want to hear from you. What resonated for you? What came up for you? What questions do you have? You can always reach out to us at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com, where I read and respond to every message we get. And we love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, consider supporting the show. There's two ways you can do it. First, you can become a patron. You can go to patreon.com slash conversations on conversations, where your financial contribution supports the people who make the show possible. You will also get access to some pretty cool conversations on conversation swag, and you'll get early episodes without ads. What's not to love? If you haven't yet, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform. That helps us get exposure, increase listeners, and be able to continue to bring on great guests like Jen Rafferty. A big thank you, as always, to the team that makes this show possible, to our producer, Nick Wilson, our sound editor, Drew Knoll, our transcriptionist, Becky Reinert, our marketing consultant, Jessica Burge, and the rest of the Snowco crew. I am grateful for you all. And a big thank you to Jen Rafferty and all of the insights that she brought to us. Well, my friends, this has been another episode of Conversations on Conversations. And I truly believe that when we change the conversations we have with ourselves and others, we can change the world. So thank you for listening. And until next week, please be sure to rest and rehydrate. And we will see you all again soon. Bye, my friends.